Hello and welcome to this channel. Late antique philosophers had a great time searching for esoteric meanings in the Homeric poems, and modern academics in philosophy departments have a great time laughing at their naivete. Porphyry and his commentary on the Cave of the Nymphs in Book uh, 18th of the Odyssey is a good case in point. These philosophers certainly were guilty of some level of projecting their ideas on the text, but this is not the whole picture. We have to keep in mind that for the archaic people, like Homer, behind the visible world there is an invisible world of various spirits and gods. For a contemporary reader, the world is nothing but this material reality around us, and he'll not look beyond it for other more spiritual realities. Likewise, he will not look beyond the Homeric text for a more hidden meaning. This just goes with the zeitgeist. But Homer and his ancient readers were not living in a world of only material and visible realities. Even if our modern cosmology is the correct one, and theirs is mistaken, ancient exegetes were closer to Homer than our contemporary ones, in that they saw the world as a visible veil on invisible realities. And that very much justifies the search for hidden meanings behind the visible text. What I'm interested here is the exoteric meaning of a Homeric episode. Yes, you heard that right. The exoteric, not the esoteric or hidden meaning. But without being open to the possibility of an esoteric application, even the exoteric interpretation will suffer. The episode in question is that of the meeting between the victorious Odysseus and his wife Penelope. Already in Roman times there was an unfortunate tendency to reduce the figure of Penelope to that of a morally upright wife. This is correct as far as it goes, but it is the least important part of her character and role. She is essentially a priestly figure and an initiator who has the authority to grant rulership to a man. This priestly role of the wife of the sovereign is well known in various European mythologies and is reflected in traditional institutions. We have the priestly figures of Celtic women who embody the land and grant sovereignty based on that. Queen Mab is a good case in point. Her sexual proclivity has nothing to do with what contemporary feminists would call empowerment. She is a sexually active figure in the same sense that the Greek Zeus or Heracles, his son and mortal reflection, are sexually very active. This is a mythological expression of the otherworldly character of kingship. In Germanic societies, the wife of a warrior chieftain is the one who serves the wine or mead to the champions and emboldens them to make boastful promises of future exploits. These warriors will be bound afterwards to fulfill their boasts because they have been made in front of a priestly figure. Just consider the actions of Werthau at the court of Hrothgar during the feast before the battle. In medieval society we have the courtly culture that revolves around the lady of the castle, with the love tribunals and all that. She's supposed to be the focus of the court, and when Guinevere betrays Arthur, the whole kingdom falls into ruin. Why? Because sovereignty for the king is linked to his queen, and medieval lords were educated through Arthurian legends and their symbolism. Penelope is the Achaean counterpart of, of such Germanic and Celtic figures as Rhiannon from the Mabinogion and Aslaug of the Volsung cycle. Rhiannon comes on the scene from the other world and she has a clear idea about who she wants to be her consort and king. Marriage with her implies a bridge between the worlds, or in other words, an integration of our plane of existence in the harmony of the cosmos. Break the link and our world falls into chaos and misery. Aslaug is the daughter of Sigurd Sigmundarsson and Brunhild. The story of Sigurd in the Volsung saga is the story of the coming out into the historically identifiable lands of a hero from mythical lands that are not on the map and where dragons are slain and treasures are found. It is the stepping into our world of a hero from another world. And it is this coming into our world from the other world that is the basis of sacred kingship and without it there can be no harmony and good order in our world. Besides her lineage, there are other elements in the biography of Aslaug that makes her an otherworldly creature, and that is why she is the proper wife for uh, Ragnar Lodbrok. Ragnar has his own claim to fame, no doubt, but if his kingdom is to be an image of success and good order, he needs a sacerdotal figure like Aslaug by his side. Keeping all this in mind, let's turn back to Penelope. She is not just any woman, she is the daughter of Ikarios, of the kingly dynasty of Sparta, and the Naiad, a water nymph. When she was born, her father was disappointed that she was a girl, so he threw her into the waves of the sea. But the birds kept her company and she returned from the water, and Icarios recognized the divine sign. He took her in again, and henceforth she was the apple of his eye. The story of a hero thrown into the waters that comes back is quite well known around the world, and it tells us that he or she has come to us from another world. It is an image of a death and rebirth, 
and the fact that this is happening where the water and the land meet tells us we are dealing with a meeting of different worlds. This should be enough to establish Penelope in the same group as Rhiannon and Aslaug. Now, if you remember the end of the Odyssey, you know that the meeting of the hero with his wife did not exactly go as he was hoping. He came to the court of Ithaca as a beggar, fought a bloody battle with the suitors and their helpers, murdered them all, separating the faithful within the household from the traitors, and meting out punishment as it is fitting for a proper king. All the time he, their son, and their faithful servants were fighting downstairs, she was sleeping in their conjugal bed upstairs. While he was exercising his role as a king by giving judgment downstairs in his palace, she was resting upstairs in the bedchamber. When she comes down, instead of embracing him, she is cautious. Eurycleia obeys the hero to make him look truly regal, but Penelope will not let her guard down, and the hero agrees to sleep separately, though he is saddened. She asks the servant to make the bed for the stranger outside the bedchamber. At that, Odysseus reacts angrily, as you would expect, and asks who could move their bed since he made it himself from the trunk of an olive tree, leaving the roots in the ground and building the palace around it. Finally, Penelope recognizes her husband, and they are reunited. That night they celebrate upstairs in the bedchamber the Hieros Gamos, the sacred union on top of the world tree. What we discover from this exchange is that the palace of Odysseus is built around an olive tree that goes through the various levels of the building, and the top of the tree was refashioned into a conjugal bed. This is clearly an image of the world around the Axis Mundi, with its different levels. On the ground level there is the feasting hall, where the suitors were eating and drinking and where the battle and the judgment took place. On top of that the bedchamber that is for the lord and lady of the palace. This description of the palace should make us remember the whole of King Volsung in the saga named after him. His father had no children, so he had to ask the gods for help. As he was sitting on the mold, he received from Odin, through the giantess Hrimnir, an apple that he ate. Volsung was thus born, and the lad, when he was of age, took Hrimnir, the messenger, as his wife. He also built a great hall around an apple tree called Branstock. In the trunk of this tree, Odin will put a sword for the proper hero. This hero will be Sigmund, the son of Volsung, who, according to the version of the story preserved in the 13th canto of Beowulf, is the hero who kills the dragon instead of Sigurd. So we have here the same imagery, the connection between the worlds established by Hrimnir and the apple, that become the tree Branstock and the union between the messenger lady and the legitimate king. Hrimnir is the source of sovereignty for Volsung, just as the tree is the source of sovereignty for Sigmund. Sovereignty is based on the connection with the other world. In the Odyssey, when the lord of the palace went away, the sacred union celebrated on the top of the world tree stopped. Chaos ensued on the lower level of the palace, and misery came upon the land, as you would expect. The hero's gamos on top is the source of harmony and good order in the lower levels of the palace, and by extension, in the whole kingdom. The sacred union in the higher level of the palace is the ritual that effects the union between the cosmic formal and material principles. This union is the image and application of the essential unity of the first principle, before any polarization into the formal and material. It is this union of form and matter that gives birth to the whole world and everything in it. So the conjugal union is a sacred ritual expressing this at a social level. And when a kingly couple does it, we have it applied to the political level. But why wouldn't she let him in? Because the manifested world has different levels along the world axis, that are particular worlds, and these particular worlds are not all the same. What goes at one level will not go for a different level. As an example, union is an expression and image at the lower levels of the primordial unity. But union and unity are two different things, belonging to two different levels. Ask Plotinus. In the same way, the palace that is a replica of the world has different levels, and what goes on one level will not go for a different level. The hall of the king is the place for judgment, that is where the subjects and strangers come to see the king and seek justice or hospitality. When this part of the palace is overrun, the king has to subject the invaders to his justice by violence. And that is what a hero does. He kills and punishes. What he needs there is strength and faithful subjects. For the bedchamber on the, on the upper level, he has to remember the layout of the palace and to know the secret that only those that belong there can know. His legitimacy stems from knowledge, gnosis, and remembering, anamnesis, different rules for a different world. What Penelope does is to ask the initiatory question that separates the deserving from the profane. Her role, as I said, 
is sacerdotal. Had not Odysseus respected her decision and tried to force himself on her in their conjugal bed, he would have applied the rules of the lower level of justice and punishment to the higher level of gnosis and anamnesis. That would have broken the world axis and the palace would have fallen into a chaos worse than before when the suitors at least respected the privacy of the queen. Penelope is not about banal bourgeois sexual faithfulness. She is the epitome of conjugal values because she is literally out of this world. Her role is to link worlds, to be a pontifex or a bridge maker, because the good order of a particular world depends on how it relates to the other worlds that make up the cosmic order. The role of sacred kingship is to order this world around a particular manifestation of the world axis, and starting from it. The vertical priesthood and the horizontal kingship define and produce a well-ordered society, and within a society, a well-ordered household. 